Is it kind of miracle? You're okay? I like, I like the sound of that word. <laughs> it sounds good. We'll see if, we'll see if I can turn it into that. I think that, that remains to be seen. This is the story of a family, part of the ruling class of Hollywood. For decades, nothing out of reach. The most beautiful nights, the most beautiful houses from the lush gardens of California to the 247 acres on the cliffs of Mallorca, Spain. And all around, all those beautiful people. It's strange growing up seeing your father and grandfather as giants projected on screens and billboards. How do you compete with Kirk Douglas? How do you live in Michael Douglas's shadow? Michael! Michael, what's happening? A child of that family is standing in the hall, getting ready to tell the story of how far he traveled before he could see his way back home. Three years ago, Cameron Douglas was released from prison. I hate to keep a beautiful woman waiting. Well, thank you. Now 40, he was confined seven years behind bars, including in maximum security and nearly two years in solitary confinement. Do I have this right? When you were 13, you were smoking pot. When you were 15, you were snorting cocaine. When you were 17, you had sampled crystal meth. 19, liquid cocaine. 26, heroin. How close were you to dying? Probably pretty close. As Cameron Douglas talks, it's hard not to be distracted. Look at the faces of the three generations, that dynasty of Douglas men. His grandfather not only played the invincible Spartacus, he was the star who made 87 films, including that huge hit 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The family's signature, a kind of tough glamour. Green for lack of a better word, is good. His father, a powerhouse producer, hit-making actor. <laughs> he said, I wanted to impress him. I wanted him to be my friend. I revered him. And good night, Cameron. I love you. Yeah. His new book is called Long Way Home. He paints a portrait of a childhood looking out at adults with intoxicating substances, the pulse of their ambition and flirtation, and very few rules. So when in the life of a happy child does something begin to go wrong? His father's career has exploded. You tell my wife, I'll kill you. Long stretches away from home. Well, well, well. And Everyone had read those rumors. Eight years into the marriage, mom learned that dad was having a fling. He says when he is seven years old, his mother, Deandra, tells him about her anguish. She says to you, he's with somebody else. What are we going to do? It's a lot of responsibility at seven years old. He's 13 years old when he's sent off to boarding school and writes of his homesickness and how dad's racy movies are getting him bullied. I'm starting to catch some more flack from basic instinct. <laughs> yeah. At boarding school, he writes, he tried his first marijuana with another student. I think just trying to test myself on a regular basis. He's kicked out of boarding schools, comes back home, where he joins up with a menacing group of kids who call themselves the sewer rats. I usually had a buck knife or a switchblade. I'm coming at you with a rock. The drugs there are cocaine and crystal meth. His parents are alarmed. There are wilderness camps, juvenile facilities, even Hazelton Rehab. We count you will be in and out of rehabs 11 times before you're in your mid-20s. Why did nothing work? Because I wasn't ready to change. Do you blame your parents? No. Is there some, an ounce of blame? There are millions and millions of, of little kids that have it way worse off than that little kid did. A father comes to join us to talk about the awful dance of lies, broken promises, hope, and despair. Do you look back and say, 
The one thing I think maybe I could have tried was, <sighs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm just you know, laughing because you, you rack your brain. You know, you take it personally. In the beginning, you start blaming yourself. That's your choice, honey. That has nothing to do with my me. My career came before my family. So what's on your mind, Kimasabi? My marriage was not great. And so you do hide yourself uh, in your work. I should have, uh, you know, focused more on my family. But that's, that's, that's hard to say when you're in the midst of a career, um, when you are you're in your own mind, stepping out of your father's shadow, trying to create a life for your own. In a family rescue mission, grandfather and father invite Cameron, who has a gift for acting, to co-star in a movie with them as long as he goes to rehab first. The movie is called It Runs in the Family. You knew you were good in it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everybody. He even got to play scenes with one of his favorite people on Earth, his actual grandmother. I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right, honey. And what about that young, beautiful mother? She is still very much a part of his life. Divorced from his dad, but moving on with young children from another relationship. And his dad marries Catherine Zeta-Jones. They have two young children of their own. And she warmly reaches out to Cameron to be with him, though sometimes he just doesn't show. She's always been a big supporter of me and been extremely loving and inclusive, even in the midst of all my craziness. So look again at his double life, smiling with his family and retreating, playing dice with death. A friend has shown him a new way to use cocaine, injected as a liquid into his veins. Your blood brings it up into your tongue and you can taste it. People call it a bell ringer because you literally hear bells ringing in your head. He is using two to three times an hour. The needles scar his veins. They're collapsing, first in his arms, then in his legs. At one point, you do your rib cage. My rib cage, my neck. You shot cocaine into your neck? Yes. He has three seizures. He writes that every injection pushes him close to overdose. He's so paranoid from the cocaine that sometimes he holds up in his closet for days. He is hiding from his father. How are you, uh, How are you doing, my Michael? The famous father we watch looking glamorous thinking he must be living a trouble-free life. But in reality, he's despairing for his child, just like so many other parents. We can hear every night all across the country. We're trying to figure out what to do, what to do, what to do. Like having Jekyll and Hyde living your trying house. Trying to save his life. I've never seen him as bad as he I don't know what else to do, and uh, he's missing in action right now. He has made a decision. He finally gets Cameron on the phone and says, you're my son, I love you, but I think you're going to die. You're gonna kill somebody or you're gonna get killed. I mean, you had, um, had, a, was, had uh, reached a point where I thought I was gonna lose him based on everything um, I'd seen and um, was not willing to emotionally commit anymore. And you said, don't you love me anymore, Dad? You know, so the words, those words were heartbreaking to me. At what point do you protect yourself or your other uh, loved ones around you before you're getting, you get dragged into this and it falls apart? Um, it destroys you, it just destroys you. In fact, police find heroin in his car and arrest him, but he manages to get off with a sentence to rehab classes. That you had available money, you were not gonna starve, you were not gonna be out on the street. Right. So as his dad limits the money, Cameron says he had to do something to get the drugs his body craved. In the past, he's experimented with robbery, putting on a mask, a drug-fueled raid on a liquor store, then a motel where an elderly woman is behind the desk. She only has $20, but he takes it. Probably the lowest point. And now he's going to target drug dealers, and he brings a weapon. How close did you come to killing someone? I don't know. I don't know. I know I couldn't, but... I don't know. But about you had a Glock at one point. In the headspace that I was in, 
during these times in my life. It was definitely a possibility, but thank God it never, it never happened. And at this time, he is also scrambling to learn a new trade, trafficking drugs across the country, crystal meth in bath salts, hidden in gift baskets. His communications are in code, his equipment encrypted. A knock on the door at the Gansevoort Hotel in New York City. I'd asked my girlfriend if it looked like they were agents or detectives, and she said no. And I said, you sure? She said 100%. And I opened the door to uh, uh, central casting DEA agent. Here he is, Special Agent Justin Meadows. At that time, he had been with the DEA seven years. That was the moment that I knew that it was, it was over. They actually grabbed me by my shirt and my neck and pulled me out into the hallway. He asked to make a call to his father, who answers so happy to hear his son's voice, Cameron freezes. He said, uh, not good. That was about as far as I got. I said, I'll speak to him. I believe he was just in a state of shock. Did you think to yourself, I've just told Michael Douglas that his son has been arrested? The truth is, is that it didn't matter. I was speaking to a father at that point. There's no words that can describe the shame and embarrassment uh, that I felt. Next, what happens to the Hollywood kid during seven years in prison? To keep from going insane, your mind has to figure out a way to adapt. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.